So let's begin. I think we've given our colleagues a good opportunity to move between meetings and to join us today. Uh, again, I would like to welcome you to this uh, third part in our series um, of Workforce Development, our certificate series. Uh, this particular module, Module 3, we're going to be looking at HR Education and Learning. And first of all, I have a big confession to make, and that is I've tried to put too much into our presentation uh, today. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about me, you'll know that uh, part of my career I spent as a junior professor at the University in Canberra, Australia, uh, working in international development as an academic. Uh, and this particular topic excites me. Uh, but one of the main things that I want to get across this whole series if you take away one message, uh, the message I want you to take away is that capacity development is not training. Having said that, uh, today uh, what we're going to do is um, unpack quite a number of things under education and learning. And uh, you'll be aware that I particularly don't use the word training as I think that can lead us down the wrong path. Again, I'd like to welcome our colleagues from around the world. Thank you for taking the time to put your name, your position, uh, and what country you're in. Uh, if you get a chance to scroll through the conversation, you'll see we have people from all around the world. You are all very welcome. We have some people from within our project, the Global Health Supply Chain Procurement Supply Management Project, and we also have some uh, visitors um, who are from people that deliver, uh, which is the international um, initiative that's working on improving the professionalization of human resources and I've also invited a number of consultants that work for IntraHealth as part of our IntraHealth bench for this project uh, to be uh, available to participate in this so you'll see there's a range of people on the call today. For those of you who are coming in um, for the first time on module three you're very welcome. You've uh, missed two quite interesting modules to start, but hopefully you have realized that in the invitation I send out, I give you a link to a Dropbox that has the recording and all the resources from the previous modules so that you won't miss out. Um, briefly, last week, we had a look at uh, maturity models and you had some reading to do about this, and this is actually what the assignment was for that particular module. And just a reminder, you're welcome just to participate uh, in the uh, webinars, uh, to engage with the material that I provide. But if you would like to receive a certificate uh, for this particular series, you will need to complete each of the five assignments. Um, and at this stage, I want to give a big shout out to uh, Anita from Rwanda, who was uh, the first person so far to submit her first assignment. So congratulations. Uh, last week we also mentioned about gender issues, the importance um, whenever we're looking at human resources to look for opportunities to ensure gender equality. Uh, and then we went into some detail about HR policy and planning. We had a discussion about advocacy. We had a discussion about the need to get data in terms of understanding the numbers involved in human resources. We had a discussion about finance. Uh, and the different areas that uh, funds are required to support uh, human resources. Um, and we spoke about a number of interventions that could be undertaken uh, for HR policy and planning, all in the context of um, a strategic approach. And if you remember back to module one, uh, we're suggesting that a um, systematic approach to human resources would initially involve an assessment around the five building blocks. And we suggest using the people that deliver uh, human resources supply chain assessment guide and tool. So that's just that, that quick overview. Um, the learning objectives for this particular module are here. And I will point out that if you're going to get the most out of this particular module today, uh, you will need to spend several hours going through the readings uh, and completing some of the activities. Um, learning is always fun and exciting. Um, it always takes time. So I would be encouraging you, if this is a topic of interest, to take the time uh, to do the readings um, and the um, go through the material that I, I set for you because I think it will set you up for an excellent understanding of this particular topic. 
And it's the readings that I want to um, go to, to to start our conversation today. Um, again, as a reminder, attached to your invitation would have been uh, this session outline that you can see on the screen. The session outlines um, indicate how many hours you need to um, put to the module if you want to get the most out of the learning. And as I confessed, this module is a bit bigger than the previous ones. So this is more up around the six or seven if you're going to do all of the reading. I want to take the time to show you some resources which are important. I'm a sharer of information uh, and so I've been collecting resources my whole career and it's my pleasure to be sharing those uh, with you as part of this five module series and in other ways. Uh, there's a particular Dropbox. The first Dropbox is for um, the materials associated with this module. Uh, the second Dropbox uh, is a range of uh, resources. Now this Dropbox is only, only uh, has material that we have been using in our project um, and our consultants from um, IntraHealth know that they're able to use this material strictly for the purposes of activities within this particular project. Um, any other PSM folks, you're welcome to use it uh, as you would like. And in that Dropbox, you'll find a range of deliverables that I've been collecting from different country activities that I undertake. And I think you'll find that very helpful. Um, the other, which is particular, uh, huge resource for this particular module, is I've put together a range of open access supply chain management education resources, either material that I've developed um, or where I've got permission uh, from universities or other environments to have that material to share. And when you go into that Dropbox, you'll see that there's a full range of material from entry point, uh, ner from nurses at service delivery points, up to outlines of master's degree in supply chain management, uh, a wealth of information uh, there. In preparation for this particular module, there's a couple of things I've asked you to do, uh, and I'm not gonna ask you to, to put your hand up if you've done the reading. But I will say, if you want to learn about this topic uh, in some detail, you will need to, to do the reading. The first is about uh, competency frameworks. I'll explain why that's important. But competency frameworks are a fundamental approach to systematic capacity development. Um, and this is something you'll hear me speak about uh, a lot. And you need to understand about competency frameworks. And you'll hear today uh, how they are helpful as part of learning and teaching. Uh, and next week, excuse me, our next module, which is in a couple of weeks' time, um, I'll be explaining how these competency frameworks uh, can be helpful um, as part of performance management. There's, in recent years, there's been a couple of quite seminal or very important articles that have come out of WHO or USAID projects. Uh, this one on transforming and scaling up health professional education is an important one. Although it's based on uh, medical and nursing, it's, it can be applied across all um, health education sectors and really shows you the big gap there is internationally. So in countries where we're saying that uh, our um, supply chain organisations need strengthening, um, the within countries, the academic institutions are also very weak in many countries and need strengthening. Uh, another interesting report that came out in 2013 was this report about um, a good framework for health worker in-service training and guidance for improved effectiveness. Fantastic points in there about how to make the best investments when you are doing in-service training uh, activities. E-learning is a very big and hot topic, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, this particular article will give you an understanding of uh, e-learning from a review conducted by WHO. Um, and this particular article from SIAPS was published last year and gives a fantastic overview of um, a range of capacity development approaches um, for competencies in supply chain. Again, they're the reasons why I selected those readings, uh, and I commend them recommend them to you. Now I mentioned that uh, this module is going to be a lot on today and we may go a little bit over time. Uh, for those of you who can stick around, fantastic. For those who can't, please come back to review the recording. But as I was preparing for this particular module, I again remind myself that there are lots of important pieces of information that I could be sharing. 
And what I've tried to do is to pick out the most important points. First of all, about what would be the principles that I think are important when you are talking about supply chain management, education and learning. And for me, it's having a methodology about how you approach this. And there are a couple of things. One is about a needs-based approach to education. We don't just drop in learning and teaching from one environment and then put it into an alternative environment, expect to have good teaching outcomes. It doesn't happen. And there are a range of principles for constructing and assessing education. Um, again, um, I've done a, a one-year degree in adult education as well as a special workplace certificate in adult education. So I've done a lot of work uh, training in that area myself. And what I want to share with you today is some of the high points that I'd like you to then go away and think about. And if you are responsible for developing curriculum um, or responsible for supervising others who are developing curriculum, I would like you to be sharing those points. And then we've got our really interactive section in today's presentation where we're, I'm going to want to hear from all of you um, around these particular types of capacity development interventions. We're going to look at those on the screen. I'm going to ask you some questions and then give you some of my thoughts. And so I'd like you to be uh, ready to, to join the conversation in writing um, within the, the conversation section of, of the Skype. So let's move forward together. So. When we're doing um, education and learning, um, many of you on this call will be aware that this is a whole science and a whole uh, profession in its own right to be a good teacher, a good facilitator of learning. And in my opinion, there are a couple of critical things to be able to help you underpin good results in this particular area. The first one is to take a needs-based approach. Now, this particular model um, was developed by the International Pharmacy Federation uh, for pharmacy education, but it's being used by WHO as their model for education across many disciplines, and I really like it. So how it works is that you think about the local needs um, in a particular country context. Um, it might be local, regional, national, international. For this call, we want to talk about local. So when I'm talking about needs, I'm saying what are the particular service needs? So in our conversation, we're talking about we want competent supply chain professionals. That's our need. Now, what are the services that the supply chain professionals provide? And here, uh, this is, a, I guess, again, a pharmacy framework, but I want us to think more broadly and to think about what is the services provided by um, supply chain professionals and we could probably say very quickly um, FASP, uh, forecasting and supply planning, procurement, warehousing, distribution, um, LMIS systems, um, um, some um, re sale and return uh, features uh, and then at the end there would also be uh, the use of the products at particular facilities. But in order to be able to teach people the skills required in that area, we have to map out the competencies. Now, these competencies need to be mapped so you can understand the building blocks that go to make up any service or area of skill, knowledge, and attitude that a professional uh, seeks to, to do. So you need to understand those skills, knowledge, and attitudes as they apply to a local context before you can then develop the education required to develop those competencies. And then you check and you make sure that your needs are met. So a needs-based model asks you to think locally about the needs in terms of the services, the competencies required in order to uh, buy those people to deliver those services, and then think about what is the education that you're going to use in order to build those competencies and in which people. And next, I want to talk about this, uh, these little circles. Now, for those of you who've done the homework, you will know what this is. And this is taken from the people that deliver a competency framework for health supply chain management. In this particular document, it maps out all of the individual behaviors that should be demonstrated in a supply chain in a particular country context. What's interesting about this document, it does not say who should do it, because we know that each country is different. 
what we want to happen, and we noted this as part of our first module, is we want competent supply chain professionals. A country will decide what CADA. We want them to be competent in these particular fields. Now, each of these circles is uh, called a domain. In competency language, uh, we have several new words. So this is a competency framework, which is a list of overall behaviors that we'd see demonstrated in the workplace. And um, in this particular competency framework, there's about 250 individual behaviors that should be present in a supply chain for it to work properly. When you break these down, you have six groups, and these are called domains. You have professional and personal domain and resource management. Uh, this particular area is the management domains. And then you've got the particular domains or the technical domains, which we've got here is selection and quantification, procurement, storage and distribution, and use. Within this context, uh, we would say that for health outcomes to be improved in countries, it's not good enough just to have the medicines available on supply. You also need to be able to make sure they're used properly. And that's why I like to have use inside my competency framework. Uh, this is one of the resources available to you. And I really would like you to take the time to read through and understand about how a competency framework works and how it's constructed because it's the basis of making quality education interventions in any of the approaches, whether it's pre-service, in-service, mentoring. Um, it's all about what are the skills, knowledge, and attitudes that you need to develop in someone? How do you know what they should be? Well, they are documented in this particular competency framework, and we would encourage countries to develop their own competency framework that's relevant to their context and I've given you a couple of examples in the reading. Let's move on together. I sat down for a couple of hours, uh, probably about six months ago, and I tried to brainstorm what would be the top 20 things that I want to tell someone working in capacity development when they're thinking about education and learning. So here's my top 20 from um, myself, uh, the top 20 list. So. Uh, you may have, have others, but these are the things that I would challenge you to think about uh, to get a good outcome for education and learning. And I'm just going to quickly mention a couple of these. Some of them are quite um, straightforward. So I want you to, the big one is think systematic and sustainably. Capacity development is not filling the gap, is not training. Who are you developing the training for? What are the actual competencies? Big emphasis on work-based application. In my research and experience, you can teach someone a skill, but if you don't, as part of that, teach them what that means in the context of their own work environment, they will find it difficult to make the leap. Not everyone can make the leap from learning something and applying it to their work environment. We have to be mindful of that. One of the things you uh, will hear me talk about from time to time is the whole of market approach, and that's beyond health. Uh, particularly when we're talking about the sustainability of uh, universities and the sustainability and growing of supply chain professionals. When you think about public, private, and humanitarian environments. When you think about development of the lecturers and the trainings, uh, I was in a call yesterday uh, with two intra-health consultants that are working on an um, activity in Burkina Faso. And one of the problems that we're going to have to think through carefully is how do we skill up academics across 17 nursing schools to be able to deliver introductory supply chain education. They, these academics have the skill of teaching, but they don't know supply chain, yet we want to make sure this material goes in the supply chain curriculum. We also need to think about the use of private sector and development sector partners as the experts. So this is part of solving this problem, and that is that private sector and the development sector often have skills uh, that can work with universities in the teaching. The other thing I want to quickly point out is a technical expert does not equal a good educator. So just because someone comes from the private sector or development sector and is a skilled professional in supply chain does not mean that they're a good educator. And so we should be thinking carefully about who's doing the teaching and what skills do they have. My second page 
Um, and again, if you're finding trouble at all reading um, any of these slides, the full slide deck is available in the link that was the Dropbox link attached to the invitation if you want to bring up the slide deck yourself and make some notes. Think about the role of professional bodies. Think about academic credentialing and professional credentialing of courses. If courses are credentialed in some way, the quality of them has been verified, then students can use qualifications to assist them in their career path. But it's also important that such credentialing of courses, either from academic institutions or professional associations, is recognized in a particular country. What's the method that we're using? Does it look at adult learning principles and consider culture? And then there's a whole range of approaches which we're going to talk about a bit later. The biggest one that's coming on the horizon is how do we measure effectiveness of competency development for workplace change? USAID and other donors are saying, we spend lots of money on training. What are we doing differently? And how can you show me that this is making a change to the work environment? How do we link with partners for scholarships and placements? How do we strengthen the management of institutions, whether that's professional or academic? And another big one that I really like is this whole idea of curriculum curatorship. The biggest expense for supply chain management curriculum is in actually developing the materials. Right? Curriculum curatorship says, well, hang on a minute, lots of people have made open access materials that we should be able to use and we can access via the internet. We can access those for free, ensuring that people are aware, um, we give credit to the materials we use, but for it to be relevant, we have to set that curriculum inside our own learning objectives and provide our own assessment so that we make sure that the people are learning what's required for our context. So I encourage the use of curriculum curatorship or the use of other people's materials, but inside your learning objectives and inside uh, your assessment. Again, I could talk about each of these particular items for a long time. Now, over the next uh, few minutes, what I'd like to do is to give you my top five or six areas that if you are developing curriculum, I would encourage you to do a bit of reading about. Because if you read and think about the things I'm going to show you in the next five minutes, it will help you create much better training materials. The first one is constructive alignment theory. Sounds pretty fancy, but really what it is all about is making sure that if you are producing education material that um, is for a pre-service activity particularly, or for which you are going to assess the students, you need to make sure that your learning outcomes actually are aligned to your assessment method. So in other words, if you claim that your materials are going to teach people certain competencies, you need to make sure that your assessment methods are actually assessing those competencies. And you also have to make sure that when you do teaching and learning activities to support your learning outcomes, that these are all consistent. Now this sounds very logical, and it is when put on one slide. But for a lot of people that develop and deliver training, it's done in a very piecemeal way with no over, no structure holding it together. And this is what that structure should look like. There should be learning outcomes. If you're doing assessment, you should develop assessment against the learning outcomes. And your teaching and learning activities should be consistent across that particular um, approach. Constructive alignment theory, there's lots of uh, cool websites and interesting things to read about that. Key point number two. Learning outcomes. If you just go and try and put uh, material together for a particular education intervention, um, you need to be clear on what it is that you want to achieve. And learning outcomes is, are the statements or the language that we would use to do that. Uh, if you're familiar with um, competency statements, then those competency statements is also perhaps another way of, um, uh, you can sometimes use competency statements as learning outcomes. But the point I want to make is when you're creating activities and you're teaching people something in supply chain, 
you could be doing remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluate, and creating. And depending on what you want the outcome of your training to achieve, you will need to construct your training with that in mind. So in other words, if you want someone to create a uh, strategic plan for human resources as part of an outcome for a module, there's no point just creating a module that helps people remember some of the facts associated with a human resources strategic plan. You actually have to develop an approach that will help your students learn how to create that strategic plan. So again, um, this sounds logical. It is logical, but not often applied. So the second point when you're thinking about creating learning materials is think about the learning outcomes. What is it that you want the students to achieve with your learning activity? And I find Bloom's taxonomy, which is a range of words from remember to create, helps me think about what I'm trying to achieve. Once I've noted that down carefully, I then can create my materials to make sure that that's achieved. I also this, use this approach when I'm preparing and delivering workshops um, and meetings that have an interactive nature. What is it that we want to achieve? Third point, what assessment methods do you use? So this is the point where I want you to type in. If you do assessment as part of any teaching and learning activity, can you type into the chat what type of assessment you use? For example, retest. So I would encourage everyone who's on the call, if you've got access to your computer, in the conversation, if you can type in what sort of assessment that you would uh, use if you are running a particular supply chain curriculum of some description. I'll use this opportunity to have a quick glass of water. A few people typing away. So um, this is uh, coming in. Now, there's a whole range of things you can use for um, assessment. So yeah, pre-tests are coming in. Um, and one of the interesting questions is, is well, how do you think about uh, assessment? Um, and again, I want to simply today open up your brain to think about assessment more broadly. So we can have a whole range of ways of doing assessment. Um, it can be formative, which means we give feedback to students. It can be summative, which means we give them a mark that gives them um, credit for a particular work. We can benchmark people against um, other students, or we can use different um, diagnosis. And thank you for those uh, coming through. So there's a lot of pre and post tests. Uh, there's people doing um, work surveys in the workplace uh, to see what knowledge is uh, an impact evaluation. So thanks for those comments. The point, the third point about constructing um, learning and teaching that I just want to highlight here is that you need to think carefully about your assessment methods if that's your intention. A lot of times we don't do assessment, but what we do need to be thinking about is how we're going to assess the impact of the training in the workplace. So it's just think about your assessment. I find this slide very helpful to help us think about all sorts of things that you can do. If you are organizing materials for a university, then you need to think about assessment more carefully than if you're organizing an in-service training. I recently worked with the University of Addis to do a supply chain module um, for leadership, governance, and management. And I worked with the university to prepare a range of assessment items to help the students reach their learning outcomes. And we use this as an idea. So um, what we did is they had to do um, a research report, an oral presentation. Um, they also had to do some um, tutorial tasks, which were mini tests in this situation. Um, and uh, so you can see we chose a variety of assessment methods. Again, uh, for this call today, it's just to highlight the fact that there are many different ways. In one of the drop boxes, um, the one for the open access training materials, you see that I have a range of material for running a five day interactive workshop for uh, nurses, nurse assistants, pharmacy assistants at service delivery points. 
the particular approach I've used for assessment in that particular course is games. And uh, just out of interest, we use a whole range of games for different parts of the supply chain to start the course and then to finish the course. So it's a pretest, but instead of having a written pretest, there are actually different games that um, demonstrate supply chain competency. So, for example, I set up a mini pharmacy and people have to count the stock or they have to put stock away, they have to fill in bin cards, and I give them a mark for that activity uh, before they start. Uh, and then on the last day, the Friday, they get to do that again. So, again, be creative, think outside the square. But the biggest aspect in terms of assessment is how are you going to measure assessment in the workplace? Um, I'm just going to go over that one. So again, we're moving pretty quickly, but again, a reminder, these are highlights about things to think about if you're responsible for developing teaching and learning materials. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen this particular uh, Um, impact evaluation, um, thanks Dorothy for noting that. I'll come back to that one in a minute. The next thing I want you to think about is, uh, apart from assessment, is what are approaches to learning and teaching? So how do we interact with our participants or our students uh, to help them? Now this particular cone of learning gives us a great insight into how we should be thinking about uh, doing things. So it's if people are just asked to read a document, we only retain 10% of what we read. If we do a dramatic presentation, a simulation, simulating a real experience, we're going to remember 90% of what we say and do. And so throughout this whole cone of learning, you can see reading, hearing, seeing, watching, participating. The more active and interactive the activities that you put together, then the more learning will take place. Now, one of the disadvantages of uh, e-learning is that sometimes, or often, for practical related competencies, it's very difficult to construct those type of activities in an e-learning environment. But keep this in mind, um, for nearly all of us on this call, we'll be interacting with adult learners, and adult learners uh, require much more um, interaction in order to be in, engaged. The other thing we need to be aware of is for adult learners, what do they know before they come? So um, uh, I would often, but not always, uh, would do a pre-survey of participants to get an idea of what competencies they are strong in and what competencies they're weak in I'd like to get an understanding of their work environment and try and make sure that any learning and teaching activities I put together involves participation, discussion, and other adult learning activities that really emphasize workplace application. That's the cone of learning. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide because um, it basically um, talks about um, anyway, I'm just going to skip over it because I'm going to come back to this point. The slide was supposed to demonstrate a way of doing a session plan, but I want to come back to that shortly. In a lot of the learning and teaching literature at the moment, one of the things that we're, a lot of people are talking about is something called the flipped classroom. Now, the flipped classroom um, works on the premise that people who are involved in facilitating or giving training are experts, so you are on the call, are all experts to varying degrees in different parts of supply chain management. And the time that you have available to interact with participants or students, whether they are existing and in service or pre-service, is limited. So the question is, what's the best use of your time when you're interacting with students in order to, or participants, in order to, to get their learning happening? Now, more and more, uh, this flipped classroom model is being used in universities and other environments. And basically, it says that students should prepare to participate in class activities before coming. So they should do a variety of reading. They should do some quizzes. They should do some different activities. And usually for the material that needs to be rote learned or helps to set the background. 
This frees up time so that in the class environment, the facilitator or the teacher can spend the time engaging with the students to practice applying the, the key concepts with feedback. And then after the class, the students can be given further uh, activities and reading to extend their understanding and learning. And this is a little bit like how I've prepared this module series. I've given you a bunch of readings to do beforehand and if you've done those readings you'll be getting a lot more out of this. What is interesting though of course is I haven't arranged different activities as part of the webinar apart from a couple of activities to get your uh, engagement. So I'm sort of falling down on that part of the application in the way we've chosen to deliver this material. But then I've given you some post readings and also um, an assignment for each module. And that assignment is to help you think about the application of this material to your local context. And I've constructed the assignments um, so that you can think carefully about what's more meaningful to you as an adult learner in your environment. Next week, um, I will be giving a introduction to supply chain management training course to USAID officials in Washington. I've given them um, quite an extensive 12-module uh, online learning course that they're asked to complete before they turn up to next week so that everyone uh, should be on the same page when it comes to basics of supply chain management. And then during the week, we have a lot of interactive activities to ensure that that learning is active, participatory, and work-based as they think about their role as USAID officials in the supply chain system of our project and others. So just something else to think about. So again, you're getting an express view inside Andrew Brown's head. And what I've tried to do is point out some of the things that you should be thinking about if you have an interest in developing supply chain curriculum and learning or if you're going to be supervising people or supervising activities where this is taking place. E-learning is a big topic uh, and more and more discussion has happened about e-learning. And the question I ask is where do we use e-learning? Um, and I've got some points here that I want to emphasize to help you as you think about this question in your own particular context. So e-learning is uh, particularly helpful for sharing knowledge and aiding understanding. So on that cone, on the um, uh, learning objectives uh, slide, it's really good for competencies where you need to remember or understand. You can use e-learning for applying and analyzing, but it's much more harder to do these upper level types of learning outcomes using an e-learning environment. The other particular um, aspect for e-learning is it's great to give you a consistent message because it's all the same. You haven't got to rely on people to interpret things. It manages costs. Now, from a student's perspective, there's ease of access, flexibility, portable, improve student-teacher contact in discussions, and increase discussions with peers. What's interesting is in my work in Pacific Island cultures, um, it was this was not the case because in Pacific Island cultures, um, interaction is considered to be suboptimal unless it's face to face, and so it would involve a bit more of a cultural shift in order to uh, really engage more in e-learning, which the many environments are doing. But just want to point that out. E-learning may not be the best if you need to teach a physical skill or teach someone a skill they will apply on the job. Now, if you think about the competencies required for supply chain management, lots of those competencies are in fact a physical skill that needs to be applied in the workplace. I am not saying that e-learning cannot be used to assist in the competency development. I am saying that it can be quite difficult to ensure people develop skills they need to use in the workplace if you're just relying on e-learning. Don't use e-learning if you just want to do something trendy and you need to think about e-learning as a tool to use in the right context. It's not an end result, it's a tool. 
And from a student perspective, sometimes e-learning may be more time-consuming, might be a lack of interaction, and sometimes people feel isolated. And you have to make sure that you are uh, connected, obviously, to the internet and have power for that to work for you. Now, when people start to talk to me about e-learning, I start a conversation and the conversation has these components. Where does the e-learning strategy fit in as part of your wider capacity development strategy? It might form a great part of a flipped classroom model where you're giving those initial introductions, as you've mentioned. Is the infrastructure available for e-learning? Who's responsible for maintaining the platform? What's the quality and type of e-learning materials? Sometimes people comment, um, to put um, PDFs up on uh, a Moodle or an electronic platform and they say that that equals e-learning. Well, that's a very basic e-learning. E-learning has come a long way and there's a number of great interactive presentations or gaming around supply chain, for example. So we need to be aware of what it is. The other interesting thing is about a third of people do not like engaging in e-learning as a preferred mode for education. Um, and I mentioned before about using existing curriculum. And if you are developing e-learning systems and infrastructure, the new technology and the new approach is using cloud-based approaches. Now, cloud-based approaches to e-learning means you do not have to maintain and back up servers in country. They can be done outside of country. Of course, the laws in that country have to allow that to happen. But the current technology uh, that's being used in a lot of low um, and middle income environments and other environments for that matter is cloud-based. A good example would be the open access software Moodle that has a cloud-based approach so you don't have to maintain large servers. Okay. As I said, we're going to go a little bit longer today. So those of you who have to drop off in about 15 minutes, I completely understand. There will be a recording um, for you to, to get the rest of the material. But this first uh, 45 minutes today, what I've tried to do is to give you some background thinking about learning and teaching. Don't go straight into developing learning and teaching materials. Think about a needs-based approach. Think about the competencies that you're looking to teach. What are the learning outcomes that you want to meet? What are the assessment approaches you're going to use? What are the approaches you're going to use? And what is the role of e-learning in your context? And as Dorothy has noted, that a blended learning approach um, uh, is um, a good approach when it comes to combining e-learning and face-to-face -face related activities. This particular Dropbox, um, I was asked to develop a two-day course to use with academics uh, at uh, universities, and we did this for Pakistan, uh, to introduce them to how to develop good supply chain management curriculum. So if this area interests you, if you want to run a workshop, or if you want to go into more detail, at this Dropbox link, which is available in your copy of the slides, you'll have a full set of uh, slide decks, exercises, um, and learning materials to really help people develop supply chain management curriculum and teach academics. So that's there for you to have a look at. Within that, um, there is also um, templates for making session plans. This is not a skill that I'm going over with you today, but one thing you'll notice is the session plans I've provided for the five modules in this particular series I've used a session plan template that I use all the time and that you'll find in that package. So you'll see that the session plan template I use outlines the objectives, clear on the resources being used, and it divides up time allocation for different activities and provides links to resources and gives an estimate of how much time. I like to be very systematic in particular um, about developing materials because in my experience, if students understand what's expected of them, they will perform and do a lot better. Any questions at this stage? So Dorothy has been quite active on the conversation. I encourage anyone, if you've got a question, any time, just to, to, to type it in. 
And in next, this next part of the presentation, I really want to get uh, your feedback on a couple of things um, uh, as, as we go. Um, want to uh, take probably about five minutes on each of these. Um, so we will go a little bit longer today for those who can stick around. Um, but I will um, just in 10 minutes time go through the assignment for this particular module so you know what that is uh, before we go. Now, I would suggest you start by thinking about what is the capacity development plan that considers all of the items, this pre-service all the way down to peer-to-peer -peer networks. These items here, one to six, are all different ways of developing supply chain competency for you to consider. What you need to think about is a systematic way of pulling these together so that you've got the capacity development uh, needs addressed in the country you work in. Um, and you'll find in your session outline that there's some examples uh, from Liberia and Burma, Myanmar of an overall capacity development plan. And within that plan, a number of these items um, are portrayed. It is not a good use of time to go directly into developing any of these programs without thinking about how they fit as part of a, a country-wide or an organization-wide approach to capacity development. OK, now I want to see who's been, who's been listening and uh, also want to learn from your experience, because uh, a lot of you have had a range of experiences. And I want you to answer this question by typing in um, some answers in the chat for me. As you consider your experience and considering the readings, what are some of the elements to consider to ensure sustainable pre-service education? If you want sustainable pre-service education to happen, what are some of the elements that you need to think about? I'd like to ask you to uh, type in a couple of things that come to mind from your experience or from what you've, you've learned. I'm just taking a drink of water. Uh, thank you, Anita, for your comment. So anyone can type in here. So um, good to follow up. Um, accurate capacity of trainers and academics. Uh, thank you for that comment. Appropriate education, where to start with. Yep, great. Um, one that I think we often overlook is the um, uh, management structures and how supportive the institutions are. Are the institutions strong enough to sustain uh, pre-service appropriately, for example? As you're typing those in, I want you to look at my list. So again, we spoke about a bunch of these earlier, and I'm not going to go into some detail, but a couple of big ones when it comes to pre-service education that I want to think about is what's the business case for the course? Donors are not in the habit of providing money to develop a course for which there's no hope of it being sustainable. And so a business case for developing a new supply chain management course uh, is something that's uh, very important. I've mentioned about strengthening the management of institutions and someone um, who's put about quality, someone's put about quality in there. Um, and the quality is about the academic credentialing and professional credentialing of the courses provided. Again, another big one that's overlooked is the development of the academic staff of the lecturers. So you guys have got most of those in the chat, so well done. The one that you probably haven't come up with that I've really I've emphasized is this strengthening the management of institutions. Now, Anita makes a good point in the chat, and that is that not all institutions can provide quality education. And this is something that you need to consider. Um, some countries have very strong quality assurance networks for education, and some not so strong. So you need to be looking at that quality and setting up an approach to ensure that quality. What does that look like? In the 10-page um, supporting uh, resource document for these five modules, one of the resources is actually a quality management guide for universities. Um, and so that's quite um, interesting. So thank you for your continued notes about what we need to think about in pre-service education. But the takeaway message is that I want you to be thinking about um, is a systematic approach, thinking about careful construction of courses, but also the development of not just the lecturers, 
but also the strengthening of the management of institutions and particularly looking at links uh, with other partners to help in that. There is a range of tools in the 10-page uh, supporting document, which is in the Dropbox uh, for Module 1. And there are four tools here that I wanted to just focus on for you. This Strengthening School Management Guide, it's actually a guide that helps think about the steps to take to strengthen a university school. Bottlenecks and best buys. When we scale up health workforce education, it's not just making the course bigger that's important. It may be that students are failing for different reasons or pulling out of the course for other reasons. And so you might be better off investing in supporting students to get through the course than you are trying to make the courses bigger. And this discusses that, something we often don't think about. What's the percentage pass rate of particular institutions? We should be only passing people that meet the competencies, for sure. But a lot of low pass rates at universities are because students are unable to sustain themselves for different reasons through to the end of a particular course. Costing methodology. Um, and the other is that there is a fantastic guide for how to develop uh, supply chain management curriculum. This is a uh, JSI Deliver, USA Deliver uh, um, tool. It's quite a nice, neat tool for that purpose. So that's pre-service education. So, yep, I'm going to ask you another question. People use the term in-service. I don't like that word. And internationally, um, we're moving away from that word. And we're using the word continued professional development. One moment, I'm just going to have a glass of a mouthful of water. So continuing professional development um, is this idea that, that ongoing education is actually a responsibility of employers, but also employees. It's not just um, a responsibility of the bosses. It's also the, also the workers' responsibility to be thinking about um, their particular uh, professional development. So I want to ask you this question. With your experience and considering the readings, what are the elements to consider? to ensure sustainable in-service or CPD. And again, uh, people are typing through needs analysis, the environment to support learning. You're welcome to type in some others uh, as we go. A sustaining uh, CPD system. Um, what's interesting is that countries that have a formal CPD system, in other words, countries like Rwanda and Kenya, which for some professions, they are required each year to get so many points. Otherwise, they don't maintain their registration. So in those environments, there's actually a, ca a stick that's being held by the government to ensure people um, engage in CPD. In Module 5 of this particular series, we're going to talk about how to develop CPD programs um, in a bit more detail. But for today, I want you to think about CPD a little bit differently. I'm just going to explain this model to you, um, and then for those that have to leave, I'm going to show you the assignment, and then I'm going to continue uh, to a couple more things. For those people typing in, um, everything's coming through very nicely. That we, with CPD, the elements that you are referring to are elements we need to be thinking about. I just want to show you this picture for a moment because I think it helps us to think about CPD in a different way and to realise that there, there are different people involved. So as uh, Philippe has noted, there's political involvement uh, as well as institutions, and that's exactly what's here. So we've got government, professional associations, technical advisors and non-governments. We've got employees... We've got regulators, accreditation bodies, education providers, funders and technical experts, and professional associations. This particular picture is for a systematic CPD in a country. So it just doesn't cover just a standard um, in-service program that you might be offering in your country. But I wanted to put this here because if you've got supply chain professionals in your country, <coughs> excuse me, if those supply chain professionals are required to have CPD in order to maintain their professional status, then all of a sudden you have carrots and sticks that drive the need for people to maintain and continue to develop 
their supply chain competency. And the reason that I want to note that is that then, and this addresses uh, Anita's question, the responsibility for the professional development starts to lie more with the employees and with the employers. Yes, we do have um, high staff turnover rates, and high staff turnover rates mean can mean that skilled people leave our institution. And in Module 4 next week, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about some detail about things we can do to retain staff and keep them in our organization. But one of the elements that's an institutional element is if supply chain professionals had a CPD proper framework in a country they had to adhere to, then there would be that driver to for in-service and continued professional development to take place. So I just wanted to highlight this aspect because I think it uh, has a, a role to play when it comes to sustainability. So my question would be, would a, a CPD framework, if adopted by these players in a country, help to make continued professional development or in-service training more sustainable? That's a, a bit of a question to think about. So I'm conscious that a number of people uh, have may have to leave now, and I will be going a little bit over time. Um, for those who are leaving, I just wanted to point out today's uh, module assignment, if you are doing the assignments. Now, in this particular module, there are six different learning and teaching interventions that we are talking about, and they're listed here. Again, this particular assignment is a scope of work question because a lot of you won't be doing these sort of activities, but you might be supervising others. Or even if you're not supervising others, before you do an activity, it's great to prepare a scope of work so that you can be clear on what it is you're going to achieve and how you're going to do it. So in this situation, I want you to consider your current country context and write a scope of work to review and upgrade an existing learning and teaching intervention. In other words, for your country context, I want you to take one of these six and I want you to answer these questions in the form of producing a scope of work. So what do you want the consultant to consider when it comes to reviewing that particular uh, learning and teaching intervention for supply chain? What methods should they use? Who should they talk to? What steps do you want the consultant to take? And what deliverables are you expecting from the consultant? So in this way, I want you to be thinking about how in your country context would you review one of these six learning and teaching interventions? And I want you to produce a scope of work. And these are a number of the questions you want to make sure that you answer when you look at that scope of work. So that's the, the assignment for this particular one. Well, I'm just, OK. So um, for those of you who have to leave just now, I do understand. And you will be able to um, pick up on a recording for the rest of this uh, seminar. But if you can stick around, I think you'll find the next 15 minutes um, quite quite interesting. So before I uh, mentioned about the um, assignment, I mentioned about uh, continuing professional development. Um, and I challenge you to think about an overall uh, framework for CPD as a way of sustaining and driving this in a country. Just something to think about. The next thing I want you to think about uh, quickly is what about what's about the role of cascade training or training of the trainers? So my question to you, and if you've got an answer, I'd be pleased for you to uh, to type in. What makes a training of a training approach effective? This is the training of the training approach where you start off with an education committee and lead trainers and you cascade through. But my question is, what makes a TOT effective? Because on many occasions, a training of the training interventions are not effective. And I want to give you a couple of points. The first one is emphasizing that a technical expert does not equal a good educator. So you need to make sure that any of the trainers that you are going to engage with are competent in adult learning and teaching methods and not just good in their field. 
And sometimes it works better if you can get people who are competent in adult learning and teaching methods and you can train train them in the basics of the curriculum that you want to deliver. You need to confirm this technical understanding. So there's two parts to a trainer's competencies. One is their competency in adult teaching methods and the second is they have a sufficient technical understanding of the topic. And what would be the process that you would do in order to uh, assess those individuals? That varies. The other important thing if people are organizing large training of the trainer activities is I would challenge them to link with an academic institution. Is it a nursing college, a university, or Ministry of Health um, training department within the human resources section? By linking with an institution of some description, you have <coughs> excuse me, um, the op opportunity to help for long-term sustainability. What are you monitoring and evaluation system is for your trainers and can you measure the effectiveness, effectiveness of the intervention to create workplace change? These are the things that I would challenge you to think about when you're doing trainer of the trainers. The next topic I just want to mention quickly because we're going to talk about this in detail next time and that's supportive supervision and mentoring. This is an excellent peer-to-peer -peer way of helping to uh, develop uh, competencies or it's a way for supervisors to help with supervisees or it's a way for seconded staff to be working um, with government staff to help to develop their competencies and again there's a couple of special things to think about just because again someone is competent in a technical area does not mean that they have the capacity to pass on those competencies to the next person. Not everyone who is a supply chain professional is good at supportive supervision or mentoring. And so I would ask the question, what competencies do managers need if they are going to be effective in supervising or mentoring? And this is what I've come up with as my list. Do you want to add any different ones? If you have any other competencies you'd like to add, then please type them in the chat. From my perspective, good communication skills, good interpersonal skills, cultural li literacy is an interesting one. It's the ability of people to interact with people of different cultures uh, in an open and honest way. Uh, yep, thanks, Anita. We're going to add reliability. Um, to that. I'm actually going to type that one straight in. That's uh, one that I've missed up. Um, and these are competencies that we cannot expect that everyone would have. Um, yep, timeliness uh, as well is very uh, important. So when you're thinking about supportive supervision and mentoring, ensure that supervisors and mentors have the competency. Is there an official supportive supervision or performance management system? Is it clear to the mentor and mentee what they will learn from the experience? Is the system supported by appropriate tools and finance? And do managers apply the approaches fairly and equitably? And again, this is going to be a topic for next week. A lot of supportive supervision um, systems break down because managers do not apply the system fairly and equitably. But the point about supportive supervision and mentoring I want to emphasize is that I don't think we take the time to ensure that people who we get involved in supportive supervision and mentoring have the skills necessary to make it happen. And so what are we doing to make sure that these particular uh, skills are present in people? How can we groom or grow um, our staff or managers to have those, those particular competencies. And just with a couple of slides to go to close, um, one of the things that's come up a number of times in this project and others is seconded staff. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to emphasize this. So the term secondment describes when an employee or a group of employees is assigned on a temporary basis to work for another host organization. And then um, on expiry of the secondment term, the employee will return to their original employer. So 
We have a lot of uh, countries where we have uh, project PSM staff embedded, seconded, working inside government supply chain organizations. And in this particular uh, environment, um, what is expected of them is sometimes not very clear. I would like to ask uh, those still remaining on the call, have you got any experience of seconding staff, any good things or any bad things that have happened with the seconded staff circumstances? I'm just going to take a mouthful. My experience is that we often in our project uh, put staff inside government organisations to support that organisation. And there's not necessarily a clear goal or there is an undefined expectation that the government at some stage will take over the responsibilities of that position. And as I go into countries, um, I'm challenged by this uh, situation of seconded staff. And I want to offer you a couple of thoughts to think about. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the most common, common points I've seen noted in work plans where seconded staff are, are present is often a general statement that uh, seconded staff will um, assist local staff in the development of their uh, competence. And um, I find that very interesting and it's a good thing to achieve. But then I ask those countries, what is the framework or what is the approach that you're using to ensure that those um, competencies are going to be, to be made? And I'm not sure if you've seen this Garfield comic before that's on the screen. That's the cat. His name's Garfield. He's got all those books from school attached to his body. And the caption is, I'm learning by osmosis. Now, for those of you who've done some science training, you may notice that osmosis is a process where um, a high concentration of something moves to where there's a lower concentration. And I think this is often what we think is going to happen for seconded staff, that they might be inside an organization sitting next to or alongside other staff and that by some miracle, there will be a transfer of competence. Now, I say that tongue in cheek. I note that um, there's been a note here that uh, perhaps um, uh, seconded staff are sometimes less skilled than those that they're going to support. That's true. I've also seen situations where seconded staff get paid a lot more money than the people they're there to support. The point that I'm looking uh, to make is that uh, the use of seconded st staff needs to be intentional and inside a supportive framework. And these are the things that I think we should be thinking about. Is there an MOU or an agreement that defines the role of the seconded staff, the period of service, and when exit will take place, the role of each party? Are job descriptions for seconded staff clear and their roles and responsibilities? Have government staff been orientated to the secondee roles? Where the secondee is required to increase the capacity of government staff, how is this defined and measured? And do the secondary staff have the competencies necessary to transfer the knowledge to others? And I think these are important points. And uh, thank you, Anita, for sharing your experience. Um, that is certainly one that I've come across. I've also come across the experiences where um, the government just expects that these staff will be supported on into the future uh, because there's no feeling that the donor money will run out um, and it can be some awkward situations. So the point that I want to make about seconded staff uh, is to consider a defined way of interacting with seconded staff and a appropriate platform where you're engaging with the, the government or the organisation where you're applying it. The last um, item that I want to talk about is a way of um, capacity development. So, sorry, I'll go back. So. Seconded staff, I'm trying to say, is one way that, uh, one tool, one approach that we can use to develop the competencies of government staff. Absolutely. The comment I want to make is 
that it needs to be done in a systematic and careful way. Um, otherwise, it will not... Um, um, get the outcomes that you intend unless you're you're intentional about it. Uh, thanks, uh, Anita and uh, Felix. Um, and uh, yes, the whole idea of uh, seconded staff having um, different approaches to their work depending on what work they're doing. Um, again, it comes back to the importance of supervision in that particular context. I want to make a, a, a final uh, note on this uh, number six. So peer-to-peer -peer networks or professional networks. Um, are, are any of you on the call, have you are currently involved in a professional network or a peer-to-peer -peer network in your country or been involved in setting one up? So a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, is a situation where people of similar skills and competencies uh, in a similar profession will link up in order to um, share knowledge, uh, share concerns, learn from each other, uh, and grow together in their profession. If you've got any experience in this, it'd be great if you can share in the chat to, to share with those on the call. The particular experience that I have is, is quite, quite varied. Um, and I was quite excited recently when I was in Nepal um, and they ran a training course for their pharmacists on supply chain. And automatically, that group of pharmacists um, got together at the end of the meeting and organized themselves a WhatsApp discussion group uh, in order to stay connected when they left that training and moved on to um, their different facilities in different parts of the country. What that reminded me is that peer-to-peer -peer networks in a particular country context need to grow by themselves in some way. You can't force peer-to-peer -peer networks to take place. You can provide an environment for a peer-to-peer -peer network to flourish. Um, there may be people looking to try and connect together, but they're unable to because of a lack of opportunity. And so that's where a project activity could be of assistance. So a couple of points that I want to share from my experience. Um, we want to encourage locally developing networks. Um, you can think about semi-formal networks, like regular staff meetings or a newsletter. They have a place as part of peer-to-peer -peer networks. For me, the biggest thing is what is in it for the participants. Participants will only gauge in a peer-to-peer -peer network if they can see that there's something in it for them. And often, peer-to-peer -peer networks need a champion, someone to stand up, a moderator, um, a leader of some description to make it happen and to um, move the peer-to-peer -peer network along to provide some administrative support, etc. Now, there are two examples that I want to give you today of peer-to-peer -to -peer networks that you can join. Uh, one of those is our Global Health Supply Chain, Procurement Supply Chain Management, Community of Practice. So this particular community is open to USAID and our PSM project staff, and it's an internal community between those two organizations to do with the project. Um, so at this point, I apologize to uh, IntraHealth consultants on the call. I can't join you up to this particular group. But in this particular community of practice, we share uh, concerns, resources, tools, and experiences um, between countries. <coughs> Excuse me. If you don't get emails um, um, from this community of practice and you would like to, then I would invite you to um, send an email to McDelawitt on the screen. And just a reminder that this is uh, available to USAID staff and our PSM folk. As Anita has pointed out in the chat, IAPHL is one is the global um, free supply chain professional network that everyone can join. And I would encourage you to join this network. It's a network of some um, 5,000 individuals from 130 countries with varying experiences in supply chain, it includes representatives from governments, from donors, um, as well as from supporting agencies. And uh, this is a way uh, to share lots of things 
and as Anne has pointed out, um, um, it's uh, something that she's found uh, very helpful. So I need to pose a question as we've been moving along. How can networks be established? <clears throat> and this is a good question. I've attempted to um, create IAPHL country chapters in Nepal, excuse me, not Nepal, in Kenya, uh, India, um, and also in Tanzania. And it's always been a bit of a struggle. And what I've learned is that peer-to-peer -peer networks really only flourish when the idea comes from the people that are the peers rather than someone externally trying to make them get together. Um, and so my advice would be to find a champion, someone who likes this idea from within the government or within your own project in a country uh, to see how you can uh, get that person to talk to others to see what their local climate is like to develop such a network. And if people are interested, is to then discuss how they might connect. Is it through a WhatsApp group? Is it through email exchange, uh, et cetera? And so that's, that's how I would uh, start to think about that. There's no exact uh, answer, but there are a couple of the key points uh, to consider. So your role, uh, so you're from Rwanda and within the project, is to see if you can identify um, some champions who are interested in this and your role from a project perspective would be able to support uh, in some way to help make that happen. I would suggest that you resist the temptation to lead and to run such a network. If you can at all get a government or some other organization that's long term in the country uh, because sustainability is a big issue there. And again, just a reminder, the reason I've mentioned peer to peer networks here uh, as one of the, the six capacity development um, uh, opportunities for supply chain management competence is that peer-to-peers are uh, all range of expertise, range of knowledge, experiences. And any of you who are on IPHL, there is so much that's shared there that people become learning sponges and you can learn a lot from each other. And if you're not, a member, I'd encourage you to join IPHL. Um, if you are a PSM project person, I'd also encourage you to send an email to McDelawitt uh, to join our internal community of practice as well. So as I said, today's been a big webinar. And so we got to 19 people at the hour mark and then we've dropped down to 11. Thank you to the 11. And to the 11 who stuck behind, I've got something special for you that the others will have to catch up on. So I mentioned earlier in this talk about open access curriculum, and I've given you a Dropbox. At this Dropbox, you will find curriculum for nurses at service delivery points. There's a 12-month certificate course um, for uh, pharmacy assistants or others, uh, supply chain technicians. There is a pharmacy technician course from Malawi. There's a three credit unit course at the bachelor level. There's some bachelor of supply chain overviews and some master's uh, degree courses. Excuse the spelling mistakes there. <laughs> I did that late one night. I'll have to go back and fix that. But if you go and have a look in this particular folder, you'll see a treasure trove of materials that you can be using as part of uh, learning and teaching. Um, the other is we did a big project in Malawi where we did a five-day supply chain management course, and you'll find those materials there, uh, and also, our 10-page uh, resource paper that I spoke to you about earlier and reminded you of will provide you um, with even more resources. Okay. The assignment I've mentioned to you, I'm not going to mention that to you again. I'll let you have a look at that and you can send me an email if you have a question. If you, You've been quite good at uh, putting questions as we go and um, I'm grateful for that. Again, thank you so much to the Big 11. A big shout out to you for sticking around to the end today. I did let everyone know that we're going to be a bit longer because this particular uh, topic is a big one and I hope that you found lots of gems in today's uh, presentation and lots of places in this presentation where you would like to go back to to get more information. What I've tried to do in today's talk is to really get you to think about the principles that underpin quality 
training and education for supply chain management. We spoke about needs-based approach to education and a range of principles from developing learning outcomes to thinking about assessment and ways of learning and teaching and the role of e-learning. What I've then done is I've then gone on to um, think about six different supply chain capacity development activities from pre-service down to -to peer-to-peer networks. My aim in doing so is to help you to really have a look um, at these particular approaches and to think about ways uh, that you could better improve those approaches in your particular country context. And I finished off today with giving you uh, even more resources and a challenging assignment. And with that, I will be now closing the webinar. I notice we've got a few people still online. So if you do have a closing question or comment, I will stick around for five minutes to answer those further questions or comments. Thank you again, Marcel, and thank you for others who have engaged in today's uh, webinar. And um, if you have further questions, then please. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Anne. Feel free to uh, type in your, your questions. Thanks, Anita. Welcome, Gerhard and Philippe. Thank you so much.